Walter Smith to run for his money and skipped all over the place. <laughs> but he's used to that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mighty God. Mighty God. Hallelujah. And maybe uh, you could go ahead and turn these lights on, Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I used to put these down there, but they're just kind of really nice by my side. And, we, should, we so appreciate Carolyn's, all of the gifts she brings to this body. So, a little bit of a weird title. It's time to clean out some closets. I'm going to move this up. It's time to clean out some closets. Uh, boy, talk about preaching to myself. <laughs> um, I don't know why it is we tend to wait until the last moment to tackle those, those big jobs, the overload jobs, uh, the overstuffed junk drawer, that bulging closet, and the refrigerator, the worst one. So that's a thing for me. Yeah, I, I put things off. Maybe you don't. Maybe, maybe you don't do that. I do that. Carolyn has one of the neatest houses I've ever oh, seen. No. Oh, yeah. She just doesn't think it's me, but trust me. It's me. And she's meticulous. She's so meticulous, she goes outside at 2 a.m. to knock the, the what slugs off her roses. No, a snail. Snail. 11.30. Oh, 11.30. Okay. Hey, that's evangelistic license. It's hard to exaggerate. So, uh, my sister Janet has her cleaning schedule on a calendar and I glanced at that calendar one day while visiting her. She schedules washing her basement windows. I mean, who does that? Except my sister Gemma. And that's wonderful. I didn't get that, Jean. Um, and, and so when we first came here and saw this building, and as I was explaining uh, to our guests this morning, the, the roof had leaked, there was damage everywhere, that entire length of this room in, the, in what we're calling the outreach hall next door was packed with junk that several previous um, occupants had collected. Sometimes it was a church, sometimes a, a daycare. It was all kinds of stuff and fixtures and old sinks and, and you name it. it. It was in there from start to finish and we had to clear it all away. We had to hire Teen Challenge to do dump run after dump run and it was all stuff that I'm sure was in the we might need this someday category. <laughs> um, and we still have I don't know how many dozen plastic straws in the pantry. I, I don't know what that thing was. Maybe it was a gift or a donation but anybody need straws come see me. I can hook you up. And um, we have enough toner to last a lifetime for a machine we don't use. We just have that, one room at a time. And uh, Carolyn helps urge me on. Uh, <laughs> she really does. She, she inspires me. Um, and Pastor Daisy, our presbyter, is the one who first showed us this church. Uh, they had advertised it had been closed for several years, and if they didn't get a pastor, it was going to just be sold and closed permanently. So we connected with him, came up here, had a cup of coffee at Naveen's, and then he brought us over here to see what we were looking at. And he was sitting right where Carolyn is now, and I was walking back and forth and looking around. At that time, all of the woodwork in those doors back there were purple. Um, not just purple, bright, bright, <laughs> bright purple. And he's watching my face thinking I'm, I would imagine, okay, now that they've seen it, we'll never see them again. And I said, I love it. <laughs> and he must have thought I was one of two things, crazy or dedicated. And since then, we have grown in our friendship with the daisies and 
they have seen our dedication and we have seen theirs and enjoyed their, their support. So after dump runs, um, after dump run, Pastor Paul fell through the floor back there because it was rotted away, the termites had eaten it. Um, so now we're rescuing one room at a time and making room for the stuff we accumulate because we might need it someday. And I wish we could save up joy, hope for a rainy day, but wait, we can. We actually can. Joy is embodied in the gift of the Holy Spirit and readily available to us. I didn't even know your name was Joy. <laughs> but God knew. And maybe he wanted to say amen to the name you were given today. Romans 14, 7 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And if we're going to entertain the presence of God, you know, Pastor Paul preached last week about the presence of God. If we're going to entertain his presence, we need to prepare a place and make room for him. That precious Lamb of Glory, who we just sang about, he sacrificed himself to become our shepherd so that we could have joy, not just in eternity, but here in this life. Hebrews 12, 2, I think it is, says, he did that for the joy that was set before him. He prepared a place of promise for us, and we, in turn, need to prepare a place of promise, a place for his presence. So, Father God, today we invite your presence. We open our hearts to the joy that you plan for us to demonstrate as we walk in faith and wait for your coming for the fulfillment of every promise that scripture has made. Father, we invite you today for you are Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. 23rd Psalm begins with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But it appears that we are creatures who tend to want. <laughs> we want. And some of our wanting is good. It's good stuff. I wanted these blinds and I went for it. I wanted to up, upgrade. I wanted the strength and ability to cover all that purple and paint it. <laughs> and God gave me that grace. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. His righteousness. God's Righteousness is a package deal. It comes with peace, and it comes with joy. And we're going to talk more about that later. So I, along, back along the lines of closets and drawers and things that need to be cleaned out, I have this ridiculous amount of socks, many of which could certainly be thrown away, and I can't bring myself to do it. I still have to turn my head away from all those neat rows of beautiful new socks that call out to me when I'm in a store. The backstory behind that is that I lived in poverty as a child. I was embarrassed about the no socks and worse, <laughs> worse things, but As the youngest of six, it was all about hand-me-downs, and I was the last one on the list. Later, 23 years later, I had a little sister, but by then, uh, we were in a better place. Uh, but my brother's red boots, he had these 
red rubber boots that were so big that they came to my knees and they were very thick and heavy. Those were never going to wear out. And I had to wear those to school every day. And I was embarrassed about it. Finally, I was able, my, my parents bought me some patent leather shoes, beautiful little girl shoes. Um, that I wore, and the reason they got them is because I was being confirmed into the Episcopal Church. Um, otherwise, that would have been an exception. Um, but anyway, I wore those shoes until they were so worn out that I wrapped rubber bands around them to keep the soles from falling off. I was happy with those shoes. And I have to monitor myself, not to overcompensate for those things and lapse into this poverty mentality, this wanting mentality, especially, and don't yell amen, Mr. Smith, especially when it comes to buying food. <laughs> and this sounds like a sob story and a boring one uh, at that, but I'm not trying to take us to a pity party. Compared to others, we were rich, and I think all of us can say the same thing compared to the way many other people live. We are rich, and we have access to what Scripture says is the richest affair, the riches in glory. Yet, we still sometimes operate with a poverty mentality as if God is a stingy God. Just look out over the ocean. And you'll know God is not a stingy God. He's not stingy with anything. Certainly not beauty. And I've heard it said that we use only 10% of our brain. I'll spare comments about what percentage I use. But that ratio increases exponentially when we're talking about our access to the power of the Holy Spirit, to God's power, the power of His presence. And we have to do maintenance on our spiritual vessels so that we don't get bogged down and ineffective. Amen. And when I talk about ineffective, I'm not talking about membership or tithe payers or any of those things that are good and of God. I'm talking about ineffective with the love of Christ that we are called to show with our representation of who He is. Yeah. And in order to make way for His presence, we have to get rid of the spiritual poverty mentality. And that can happen with a simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah. And we sing hymns that say, He is all I need. He is all I need. That's right. Or nothing I desire compares to you. But these hymns are making bold declaration. And we need to be careful. We need to make sure that when we're singing, that we mean it. That we're telling the truth. Telling the truth. And we can choose to walk in His presence. In the presence of God. Isaiah cried, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And Moses undid his shoes in front of that burning bush. One of the challenges of planning what we call worship in the contemporary church is that if we aren't careful, it can become routine and obligatory. A session sandwiched between prayer and the sermon. And I tend to change things up as led. Sometimes it's as led, sometimes I just forget where I am. I play by ear, and sometimes I get lost in it, and I forget that it's all of us together singing these songs. 
And the way I picture having church is something that looks more like a gathering around a campfire or around the table. Deborah posts these wonderful pictures of her family gathered around the table or lined up on the beach in front of a surfboard. The way we approach God's presence should always be with respect and awe. The pictures Deborah posts of the elk in her yard. You only get those shots if you know how to be quiet and wait. Don't be like the people who try to get a selfie with a grizzly bear. <laughs> they live to regret it or die to regret it. And don't try to get a selfie with the devil. And those of you who know me are already suspecting I'm going to go to social media. But If we aren't prayed up, if we spend the moments before church yelling at the kids and running around saying, where on earth are my keys? We miss out on having our hearts prepared for the presence of God. And yet God, who inhabits the praises of his people, he receives us. He shows up. He takes us as we are. He takes our voice. He takes our musical ability. All of it. He receives us where our heart is. And it took me a long time to learn how to keep house. It really did. I have instructed women sometimes in ministry. I've heard them make comments like, what, was she born in a barn? Some people were. Some people did not have someone to show them how to make your bed every day and brush your teeth and how to do that routine daily maintenance. And I had to learn on my own. Throw on an old t-shirt, some loud music, go to town on the house. I don't have the energy to do that anymore. But then all of a sudden I look at all the clutter and think, okay, I gotta do that again. I gotta do some rescue cleaning. <laughs> Took me a while to do the daily maintenance cleaning, and I'm still learning. But if we don't do the daily maintenance with our spirit, we end up with spiritual clutter. And that results in what my mother used to say, looks like a cyclone struck it. Spiritual clutter manifests itself in a critical and angry, judgmental spirit, even to depression and hopelessness. We only need to lift our eyes to the one who receives us, exchanges our filthy rags, scripture says, for his clean ones. And every time I've ever prayed and asked, Lord, where are you? He's answered me with, I'm right here. I'm right here. Didn't I tell you I'm never going to leave you or forsake you? When we're feeling spiritually empty, it isn't the Lord who is keeping us at arm's length. It is we who fail to make our way to that well of living water. And I don't know why he has to remind me at this point in my life that he's with me. But I sometimes let what I see happening around me block my view of his presence. And when I remain in his presence, I remain in his love. 1 John 4.18 says, there's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And I still lay awake and think, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? And I have to remind myself of how faithful God is. Yesterday morning, um, <laughs> uh, Paul took a shower, and when he went to turn the water off, the water wouldn't turn off. And it was just hot, and it was spewing out. And, and I started running around... Um, trying to figure out if there was a way to shut it off at the tub and not have to go out to the street and shut off the water, which includes water to the church and to the parsonage. And I was 
in the middle of painting a clear coat on the wall. I had a whole list of chores lined up that require water. You don't think about how much you need water until you don't have water. So I called Nicholas, who's probably sleeping because he was probably up all night fixing somebody something. And he came, helped shut the water off, and then he helped shut it off in the tub. Actually, it, it had a trickle for a while, but he found a way to keep it at a trickle so that we wouldn't have to shut off the water to everything else. And, and I said, okay, we're going to have to call a plumber, and I'm walking towards the living room where Paul is, and I said, Paul, call that man that we called when we first got here and needed a plumber <laughs> because I knew that Paul has been praying for this plumber ever since then. And we never were able to make a connection with him or meet him, but a few months ago, Paul was led of the Spirit to mail this plumber a copy of the daily devotional that he writes. And so he's been on our hearts for a long time. And Nick's saying, no, 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 don't call a plumber, it'll cost you an arm and a leg. And I'm saying, yeah, well, at least we can witness to this man. We're just going to have to do it. And Nick said, no, you're not. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to fix it. So eventually, um, Nick and I went to Ace Hardware together to get the parts we needed and figure out which parts we needed. And as I was going towards the checkout line, Nicholas ran into a gentleman in a paratrooper uniform, clearly retired, airborne, began a conversation uh, with him, and I'm, I'm moving forward, and then Nick comes and he introduces him. He says to the man, this is my pastor, this is who I've been helping, and he says to me, this is Tim Mortimer. Tim Mortimer is the plumber that Paul has been praying for. The one that we didn't call. So God made a way for our faucet to be fixed and a way to witness to Tim Mortimer. And he told me, by the way, I've been thinking about your church. In fact, just yesterday I was reading that devotional that Paul wrote and I'm going to come visit your church. How amazing. Why do we fear a God who does cool stuff like that? Amen. Why do we fear? In our social media, here it comes, pages can become cluttered with friends we've never met and strangers who like to present themselves as friends. Many are fear mongers. He said, fear not, and we say, you better be scared. Last week, I boosted Pastor Paul's sermon. Boost on Facebook. You can push a button. It costs about $10 to send it to whatever geographical area you want. I sent it out to people in McKinleyville. I've always hesitated because I don't want to spam people. But I wanted it to be available so people will know who we are. And, and because it was such a particularly timely message. And at the end of the message, Nick testified about some of the experiences he had in combat. Incredible testimony at the end of it. So I boosted it. And I've done that from time to time on holidays or at special occasions when we've had someone come and speak. And I've never had a negative comment. But last week, I got a barrage of horrible negative, even blasphemous comments about God. <laughs> blasphemous comments. Now, I'm not exaggerating in this case. We got so many positive things, mainly of course from people we know or who know of us from different churches everywhere. But the comments were made by confessed atheists who more than likely didn't even listen to the message. They said things like, get a job, get a real job. And I'm like, my goodness, Nick had a real job. Four tours of combat duty for our benefit. My husband's worked since he was old enough to walk. <laughs> He's always been a worker. 
and he's earned his retirement, and he's still working. So you, you can get riled up. But I didn't. I didn't. And I, I don't want to delete people. I don't want to be a cancel person. But when they begin to curse God, then I will hide that from not only my view, but from the view of people who are there because they want to hear the message. And I have a right to guard the peace of my household, and that includes the space we occupy on social media. Some people say, well, just quit social media. But that is a venue that I have to reach former co-workers, family members, and see my grandbaby that I don't get to see otherwise. I try to live peaceably with all God's creatures. Nick and I were having a conversation. I was finishing a wall in the closet and I wear a big floppy hat because I hate spiders. I shouldn't even, I don't know, <laughs> know if hate is the right word. I, I'm afraid of them. I've had some really scary experiences, but with all the work here, I've had to kind of deal with that fear. And I try to live peaceably with spiders, but if it comes at me, it's a dead bug problem. That's, that's all there is to it when it comes at me. I haven't conquered my fear enough not to make sure that thing is not going to fall on me. And I get it. I know people are in a state of anger and disillusionment. I've been there especially as a teenager. And I can't imagine teenagers today not being there with what they've been given. That's why this room next to us that we've tried desperately to get finished before school starts again, that's why we're dedicating it in the hope of being able to provide a safe place for young people to come. When we had our transitional project at a hotel in Sacramento, and for those who, who don't know us, we it was a 200-room motel that we used as transitional housing. We ran the motel, but we also ran a program to help families, to help families who were struggling with addiction or homelessness. And when we first got there, the paramedics, here, here comes Nicholas. Too late, we already talked about you. <laughs> so when we had this project, at the beginning, paramedics wouldn't even go there without police escort. It was a scary place with a scary reputation. And Paul, I would actually send my husband to go run off the drug dealers and prostitutes who were working the corners near the motel and tell them to go peddle their trade elsewhere. And he would always offer them the gospel first. We will help you get right, or we will help you get going. <laughs> That's kind of how that worked. I actually had a prostitute try to hand me a baby for 20 bucks. She was selling the baby. You know what I did? I pulled out at 20 bucks so fast. Why would I say no and watch her walk away and sell it to someone else? Of course, then I called social services. And Paul preached a meeting, a seven-day revival, in Oak Park, an area in Sacramento, prior to us starting that motel project. And a group from the church, along with Paul, um, decided to do like a march around the community to let people know that meeting was coming. I was still working full-time, I think, at an insurance company at the time. But they were walking around the community inviting people to their special meeting. And the group presented the gospel to whoever they met. But at one point, they presented the gospel to a prostitute. And she was receptive to their invitation. But with tears in her eyes, she asked, you remember? She said, if I pray with you today, where will I go tomorrow? That was a valid question. I mean, it's easy for us to say, you need Jesus, come on. But there was a pimp 
keeping his eye on her, and she knew that if she turned her life over to Christ, where would she go to be safe? Would anybody in, normally in church bring her home with them? We're not normal, we've done that, but that is one of the things that inspired us to start that motel project. Because the next time somebody asks us that question, we wanted to give an answer. You'll come home with us. You'll come to the Pathfinder Inn. Wow. That's beautiful. So, this week, I finally blocked a Facebook friend who frequently criticizes other denominations, other faiths, other believers, and I get irritated every time I read his post. He's not an atheist, he's not an agnostic, he's a religious man, he's a Christian, and he quoted a scripture about cutting yourself in tattoos and proceeded to condemn anyone who cuts themselves or has a tattoo. And the verse he quoted was from Leviticus 19, 28. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Of course, that was just a simple scripture taken out of context. And a woman responded to that post. She said, I had to have my baby cut out or it would die. Am I going to hell? And the actual verse does say, don't cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. It was an ancient pagan custom for mourners to gash themselves as a token of their grief. We were law enforcement chaplains. I attended the death of a young Asian gang member, and I went to this little home, and the tradition, the mourning tradition, was they hurt themselves. They flail. They bash their heads against the wall and on the floor. They pull out their hair. Probably one of those... The most difficult calls I went on was at that house where I looked over and there was a three-year-old bashing her head against the wall. It just broke my heart. And yet she was doing what she saw was the right thing to do. You see, these things aren't that simple and when taken out of context, Anyway, it's no coincidence that people today pierce, wound, and slash themselves and apply tattoos. Young people cut. Prisoners who've committed murder sometimes have a tattoo of a teardrop <coughs> on their face. Many of whom we housed in our transitional project. For some, it's a sign of remorse or regret. For others, it's almost like they wear it as a badge of honor. But what God condemned Jews in concentration camps who were forcibly tattooed with a number. My dad had the marine emblem tattooed on his arm. It was such a comfort to me. I'd climb on his lap and trace. And he earned it. He and his buddies all went. They probably got drunk and went and got tattoos. It was the thing they did before they faced landing on the beach at Iwo Jima. So who am I to judge? I watched that tattoo grow old and faded, but to me, it was a symbol of strength and comfort. And That's just me. That's just me. But people sometimes, and I, Again, I don't want to get into legalistic stuff. I don't personally have tattoos. But I don't ever want to condemn and shame someone who does. That's not my business. That's God's. People sometimes quote random verses out of context, put a pretty picture behind it, call it a meme, whatever it is, to appear spiritual. And after a couple of years of getting irritated with this person's theology, I realized, I don't have to do this. Why do I keep looking at what offends me when I can choose not to look at it? I've never even met the man. I claimed him as a Facebook friend because he's a friend of my 
friend of a friend of my husband, but I don't even know if my husband even knows him. <laughs> and I'm always afraid. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So I don't delete them. I just remove their posts from my feed. I did that to my own son. He has some ideas that don't line up with the love I want to portray, with his own ideas. So I don't cancel, I don't delete, but I hide some of those posts. Using the scripture as a weapon to shame or ridicule someone is a sure sign of religious burnout. Lee? Uh, uh, one of uh, my favorite verses is uh, John three seventeen. Okay. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn yes. the world, yeah. but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. You're right on, Lee. Right on. So using the scripture as a weapon to shame or ridicule kind of displays a kind of hypocrisy that we're famous for. And it doesn't draw people to Jesus. Jesus deserves better than a copy and pasted hallelujah. Pharisees and Sadducees came against Christ in the same manner. That's right. So I, I think we just need to get some perspective when we're wanting to entertain the presence of God in a way that's real, in a way that's pleasing to Him. Regardless of our beliefs, I don't recommend, recommend turning to the God of the Internet for wisdom. And people really do. For everything, how to decorate your home. Old women aren't supposed to wear their hair like this and no glittery eyeshadow after age 50. I don't know why. I, I just know that as a pastor, as a woman pastor, and as an over 50, way over 50 woman, I kind of made a decision that I'm going to go ahead and be who I am in Christ. Remember that childhood game, Simon Says? And I hope I don't disappoint anyone today with the revelation that Simon was not real. It's okay not to do what Simon said. And not like that Simon person or Murphy who made that nasty law and the nebulous cloud of wisdom that people call the universe. The universe told me to do this. God, on the other hand, is real. He is real. And even church people sometimes try to promote this illusion of faith with a list of religious do's and don'ts. And after a while, God breaks in, in his way, to say, it's time to get real. It's time to get real. And I believe for the church, it's time. It's time. Yeah. Psalm 27, 4, Nick and I talked about this. Scripture while he was putting up those blinds. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. This broken down building, I find so much joy in it with all its faults, and I get to come over here, because I live just a few footsteps away. I can come over here in my robe and slippers to pray anytime I want. Amen. And I feel like that is the fulfillment of the dream I had explained in that Psalm 27 4 when I memorized it as a child. One of the first scriptures I ever memorized. We are here for His presence to behold His beauty. It's ugly out there. We need to come together and worship Him to bear witness to His love and His beauty, to spend time in His presence. And I'm going to conclude. Some preachers give you three or four conclusions, but <laughs> I'm going to conclude soon. But I want to read Proverbs chapter 4, starting with verse 20. And that says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life 
to those who find them, and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. We have to guard our hearts if we're going to entertain the presence of God. We have to make room. We have to guard our hearts when we're driving. There's a safety corridor up there. I get, I go through a battle every time. I want to put a neon sign in the back of my car window that says, what don't you understand about turn on your lights and speed limit 50? <laughs> but that's not something I need to worry about. I need to be concerned with what I'm doing. I need to guard my heart from getting anxious about stuff. What is it they say in the serenity prayer that I can't control? We need to guard our hearts when we're speaking to family members, especially among family members who have a different perspective. My family, pretty much, they are all of a different faith in many regards. But we were all people of faith. So that's the good end of it. My sisters, my Catholic sister, helped fix my thinking when I was upset about my daughter belonging to a certain faith. And she said, Jane, just be glad she's seeking God. My brother tried to be Buddhist, but it didn't work for him. And at the end of his life, he turned his heart to the Lord. When we're speaking to strangers, we need to guard our hearts. We have no idea. We had a neighbor, very elderly, shuffled to the mailboxes every day, and people just saw him as one of those old retired people. I learned at his wife's funeral that he'd been a prisoner of war in a Japanese camp. He was born in Hong Kong. He spoke fluent Mandarin because of it. And he was an FBI agent because of his abilities. And he was a godly, godly man. We don't know who we're speaking with. And when we're on social media, guard our hearts. When you're listening to me preach too long, guard your heart. <laughs> Don't listen to your heart. It's going to deceive you. But guard your heart. Make room for the presence of the King of Kings. I said I would conclude. I'm concluding with this. Make room for the presence of the King of Kings to fill you with righteousness. Whether you're here in a church, home, driving your car, make room for the presence to fill you with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost.